Hi, this is Bartosz Miluski with the ninth installment of the C++11 concurrency series. Today I would like to talk about condition variables which are important in message passing because they are the building blocks of message queues. Here's a diagram that illustrates the idea of a condition variable. A condition variable is an object that is shared between two or more threads. Here we have a producer thread and a consumer thread. The producer calls the notify method and the consumer calls the wait method. So in this case wait is called first then the producer calls notify which wakes the consumer up and the consumer continues. Now if the order is reversed the producer calls notify first and then the consumer calls wait then the notification is lost. It means that the condition variable does not have memory, it doesn't have a state, it does not remember that notify has already been called. There could be multiple consumers, there could be multiple producers as well, but here's the case of multiple consumers and uh, not notify is actually has two versions, one is called notify1 and it wakes up on the one thread. So here we have two consumers, they are both waiting and producer calls notify1 and in this case consumer1 wakes up and continues. The next time producer calls notify1, consumer2 wakes up and continues. Here's the notify all version. Two consumers are waiting, the producer calls notify and both consumers wake up and continue. Here's an important detail. On some operating systems, it's easier to implement condition variables if you can have spurious wake-ups. A spurious wake-up is when the consumer wakes up even though nobody called notify. If you think about it, a condition variable is not a very good communication channel. It can transmit only one bit and it doesn't do it reliably. The recipient doesn't really know if it was sent or it was a spurious wake-up. So it's pretty amazing that this primitive condition variable can be used to create very reliable protocols of communication. And one such protocol is based on adding additional state to the condition variable. So here we have this shared state, a variable v, and the first change is that the consumer before calling wait will actually test V. Now what this does, it eliminates this problem of the consumer being too late and missing a notification. Because if producer has already set V and sent the notification, then when the consumer calls wait, it tests the variable V before calling wait. And if it's true, it will just proceed without calling wait. Now if it's false, it calls wait and blocks. Now the producer sets the variable v first and then calls notify. Whether it's notify all or notify one, doesn't matter. The consumer wakes up and retests the variable v. And here you see that actually retesting of variable v is not only protecting us from spurious notifications, but it's in general a good idea in any multi-threaded program. Because between the producer calls notify and consumer tests v, there is a period of time during which some other thread can modify the state. Or it could even be the producer modifying the state again. So here's this protocol, the shared variable protocol in code. The producer thread sets v to true and calls notify1. The consumer thread in a loop first tests v and if it's not true then calls wait on a condition. When it wakes up it retests v and again possibly calls condition wait. The problem with this is of course we have a shared variable we have shared state and one thread is writing to it 
while the other is reading from it. It's a classic data race. So we have to have some locking protocol on top of it for this to be correct. From the producer's point of view, it's enough to take the mutex, lock guard of mutex, create the lock guard, set the variable, and then release the mutex in the destructor of lock guard, and then call notify1. The consumer is a little bit, bit more complex. The testing of the variable v has always to be done under the lock. So we have this lock, we test the variable in a loop, call condition wait, and wait until we get the notification. This code has a problem, because if the consumer holds the lock, keeps the mutex all this time locked, then the producer has no chance of changing the state, because the producer has to take the mutex, has to take the lock on the mutex in order to change v. So what happens is that wait actually takes the lock as an argument and the first thing it does it releases the lock so it gives the producer a chance to modify the state otherwise they would be deadlocked and this is why the lock that we are using in a consumer thread is not a simple lock guard instead it's a unique lock a unique lock has additional methods lock and unlock so this is what condition wait does it unlocks the lock and then waits until a notification comes when the notification comes it relocks the lock so this whole testing and the code that goes after this is protected by the lock but inside wait the lock is released let me show you this in a diagram so we do have pr producer, consumer, and now we have the shared variable in the middle. Consumer takes a lock on the shared variable, tests it, and if it's false, calls wait. And the wait releases the lock and enters the wait state. Now the producer takes a lock, sets V, and sends a notification. At this point, consumer wakes up, takes a lock, returns from wait, and then tests the variable v. And of course what happens when the variable v is not set? Well it goes back and calls wait in a loop. The important thing is that these two things, unlock and enter wait state, are done in one atomic operation. Let me show you what would happen if these things were not atomic. So suppose that unlock happens before entering wait state and there is this window in between. So here consumer tests V under the lock and releases the lock. And at this point the producer has a chance of taking the lock, setting V and sending the notification. But this notification is lost because the consumer is not in the wait state. And remember, the condition variable has no memory. It can only wake up another thread if this other thread is in the wait state. And because this pattern of looping and retesting is so common, there is a special version of wait that hides the looping. So here's the old code and here's the modified code. This modified code does not test the variable before entering wait. Instead, it passes a predicate to wait. A predicate is a function that returns true or false. It could be a pointer to function, it could be a function object, or as it is in this case, a lambda. This lambda here captures v by reference and returns its value. So what happens is when you call wait you are under the lock and the predicate is called. If it returns true then the wait returns immediately. If the predicate returns false then the lock is released and the thread enters the wait state in one atomic step. When the thread wakes up 
it retakes the lock still inside wait and calls the predicate. If the predicate returns true, then it returns from wait. If the predicate is false, then the thread enters the wait state again and so on. And all this looping is done inside of wait. So when the wait finally returns, you have a guarantee that the predicate is true. You don't have to test it anymore. And you are under the lock, so the predicate will not change for the duration. Let's do some coding now. Here I have an application that I've been developing for some time. This is a directory listing application and it went through several changes using different paradigms. So now it's time to rewrite it once more using the message passing paradigm. A message passing paradigm requires a slight change to the architecture of the program. Here we were creating a separate thread to list each directory. Once the thread was done listing one directory, it would just terminate. With message passing, we want a different architecture where each thread is a server. A server thread has a server loop inside. The loop starts by waiting on a message queue, waiting for a work item. Once the work item arrives, it performs its job and then goes back waiting on another work item. In our case, the server will be a directory listing server, it will wait for a directory path that will be passed to it in a message queue, and then it will list this directory. While it's listing the directory, it will produce more subdirectories and file names. It will put these subdirectories and file names on a message queue, or actually on two message queues, one for directories, one for files. So a directory listing server is both a consumer of directory paths and a producer of both directory paths and file names. So let's write a message queue. A message queue will contain a queue. So I will include include deck. That's a standard library double-ended queue. And we'll need a condition variable include condition underscore variable. It's a long name. Okay, now we will need two queues, so I will templatize the queue on the type of message that it's being passed. So template class T. That's the type of the message. Class MSG Q. Okay, and it will contain an actual Q. So STD deck of T, right? I'll call it Q and it will contain a condition variable std condition variable I'll call it cond and of course condition variable requires a mutex so we'll have std mutex and we'll call it mutex Okay, now time for public part. So a message queue has actually two methods, send and receive. A send will be a void, void, send. And let's say we are passing everything by move semantics. So we'll pass t as an R value reference. So this is our message. Right, and we need a method receive, and receive will return t. And take nothing as an argument. Okay, now for the implementation. 
So remember, send will have to notify the receiver that the message is ready. So that's that's for sure. We will have to do cond notify one. But before it notifies, it has to make a change to the queue, right? And this change has to be done under the lock. So I'll open here a new scope and create std lock guard of std mutex. I'll call it lck of mutex. So we lock the queue and then we'll just push our message. Q push front. It's a double ended Q. And we want to move things, so STD move message. Okay. Okay, so this is send. We lock the queue, we push the message on the queue, and then we notify the receiver. The receiver, this is a little bit more complicated, because the lock that the receiver uses is not the lock guard, but unique lock, std unique lock, and of the same mutex, std mutex lck of mutex and now it should wait for the condition variable cond wait and it takes the lock remember lck and since we want to do the looping inside the wait we'll pass it a lambda we'll pass it a predicate that says okay it seems like there is a message now so this predicate will just return return what it will return q empty not q empty so if if the queue is not empty we should wake up close since the queue is not empty we can retrieve the message message we don't have to do any checking at this point std move we want to move it right queue back and we have to pop it back q pop back and return return message and that's it that's the message queue let's write the server now so we'll change the name from list dear which was sort of a one-shot thread function to a server and instead of passing it a directory name, directory path, we'll pass it instead a message queue. In fact, two message queues. Message queue for directories, which are paths. And we're passing it by reference because we are sharing it between threads. So we'll call it dir queue and message queue for file names which are strings std string also by reference and we'll call it file queue quite often server loops are written as infinite loops so i'll write a, an infinite for loop and inside this for loop we'll just block waiting for a work item, which in this case is a directory path. Path dir equals, and we get it from our directory queue. Dear queue receive. 
So if the queue is empty, this will block. And once the queue contains an element, it will return the element, which in this case is a path. So now we are ready to list this directory. And inside the listing, we'll send the directories to the directory queue. Dear queue, send the path. And file names will send to the file queue. And we are done, except for send. While we are at it, Let's write another server. This one will be waiting for file names and print them. So let's call it print server. It takes a message queue, message queue, this time of standard string, std string, because these are the file names, of course by reference, because we are sharing it, and we'll call it Let's call it name queue. Because this is a little bit more general than just file queue. Right? We can print any name. So, again, an infinite for loop. And we'll wait for a string, std string, that is the name equals name q receive and just print it std cout name std and line that's it that's a very simple server now I have to create the queues and launch the servers. So let me start with the queues. I'll just paste them here. And I want to prime the queue so that when the first server starts, it already has some work to do. So I'll put in dear queue. I'll send to it my root directory. We have to move it. Root dear. First server will grab this work item and it will start listing this directory. And while it's doing this, it will produce new directories and send them to the message queue. And other servers will pick it up and continue the work and so on. So now I'm creating uh, the servers. So I'm launching async. Uh, the thread function is the server. And the arguments, it expects two arguments by reference. So std ref. And the first argument is, I think, the dear Q. Dear Q. And the second argument, also by ref, is file Q. Okay? One in parentheses. So we have 10 directory servers, and we also need one server for printing the files. If you push back I'll just copy this and add it so instead of list dear server it will be the print server and this will be my queue actually file queue File queue. Okay, we have started the servers, we have the job. Okay, now we have to compile it, and of course it doesn't compile. Why doesn't it compile? Because I made a mistake. 
and the mistake is right here I'm using Q inside a lambda function but I haven't captured the Q and the Q is actually part of the this object so I have to capture this this is captured by pointer so that's fine now it should compile and run there is of course one little problem with this program it never terminates I wrote these servers in such a way that they are infinite loops and there is no condition to break out of these loops and of course I could modify this program and introduce some mechanisms to fix this problem but I don't have that much time so I'll leave it as an exercise to the reader but I can give you a few hints one hint is how do you decide that the job is done there are two conditions one condition is the message queue must be empty so there are no more directories to be listed but this is not enough because there could still be servers running that will produce new directories to be listed so the second condition is no servers are active so you will have to have some mechanism that counts the number of active servers at any point in time the second hint is how do you break from the loop and I think the simplest solution would be to just send the server an empty string and you could be testing for an empty string and when you detect an empty string you just break out of the loop.